Hey everybody, my name is Elizabeth McSwan from Emac and Hedwig. In today's video, I'm going to talk about five things that you can do to immediately improve your wildlife photography. So here we go. When you're out in the field photographing, there's a lot that you have to think about from a technical perspective. And thankfully, as you gain more experience and you get you know, out there more and more, that stuff sort of starts to become second nature and you don't have to think about it as much, which allows you room to think about the more creative decisions. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about five things that you can do when you're out in the field photographing that can get you better photographs from a creative perspective. Number one is head angle. Head angle is really important when it comes to bird photography or any type of photography, wildlife photography really. I'm going to be using bird photography a lot in these examples, but this really applies to any type of wildlife photography. Head angle is important because it connects the viewer to your subject. My rule of thumb is I want the bird's head to be parallel to the sensor, that is dead profile, or turned more towards camera, maybe like a three quarter turn or even sort of a more dead on to camera look. For purposes of this example, I've got this little guy here. This is my little hummingbird. My 6400 doesn't want to focus on my bird. It's too good at, at detecting my face. Now we're cooking here. Okay, I had to step out of my shot. So, so this right now, this bird, this hummingbird is parallel to the camera sensor, right? It's dead profile. And so if you see, it, but the minute it turns away like this, for me, the shot is just gone. RIP, Deadsville, just gone. So I like to have my shots be parallel or even kind of more towards camera. With birds with long beaks, I don't really like the head on look. I just think that it distorts the beak too much, but that's just really personal preference. And certainly the head on look can work uh, with other birds. But hopefully um, you can see the difference between something like this and something like that. In addition to the hummingbird, I also wanted to give an example of an actual series of photographs that I shot. This is of a double crested cormorant. And as you can see, the cormorant is looking away from me. As a result of that, there's really no connection with the viewer. There's nothing to really draw me into this shot. And, and it's just not that interesting. And then you go from this to this, and this is a little bit better, but it is still looking away from camera. The head is still not quite parallel to the camera sensor. And then you go from this to this, and this is parallel. So if you can see the difference between this one and this one, it's subtle, but it definitely is there you see the eye much better. And this is a shot that I, I processed. Most of the shots that I'm gonna show in these examples are not processed. Um, so certainly I could brighten up the eye a little bit here, but it's not just how bright the eye is, it's also how visible it is. If you look again between this one and this one, the eye is just much more visible to the camera. And you may say like, I don't really see a difference between this one and this one, and this one seems fine to me. And I would just really encourage you to, to have a more discerning eye and to really pay attention when your subject is looking away because even though it's a subtle thing, I think it makes a big difference. And then just to show you some other examples of other head angles, you know, this is definitely more towards camera as is this one and this one. But in this particular instance, I chose to process and post this shot because I really liked the back feathers. I thought that they added really awesome texture and I really loved that you could see the crest so well here because you don't always see that with double crested cormorants. They don't always kind of raise their crests like that. So I really like the fact that you could see it. The eye is very prominent in this shot. So for those reasons, I decided to post this shot. Number two, number two is sun angle. When I first started bird photography, all of the like literature and videos that I watched talked about having the sun at your back, pointing your shadow at your subject. The reason why that type of lighting, kind of frontal lighting 
is flattering for birds is that it basically creates zero shadows on your bird. Sometimes the beak of the bird can create an odd shadow onto the, you know, onto the breast or upper upper throat area depending on what angle the sun is at. And if it's frontal lighting, it really won't do that. Of course, another really important part about sun angle is how high or low it is in the sky. Generally speaking, if you have a sunny day, the first few hours of daylight are the best and the last few hours of daylight are the best because the sun is low and it's more eye level with your subject, which again is generally more flattering. But you can certainly make other kind of lighting situations work. What's important is that you're thinking about how the light is hitting your subject and what it's doing. Is it flattering? Is it creating these weird shadows? And that's really the most important thing. I will sometimes cheat the sort of sun at my back pointing my, my shadow at the bird, and my shadow will actually be a few degrees to the left or to the right. But what's important is to work with the head angle of the bird so that at least the eye and the head is being nicely lit by the sun, even if the sun isn't completely behind you and it's maybe more over one shoulder or the other. You can also use the sun as backlighting and get some kind of interesting silhouettes and interesting lighting that way. It's really about using the sunlight to your advantage and knowing when it's working for your subject and when it isn't. And that does come with experience. And if you want to start your photography with kind of more frontal lighting and pointing your shadow at the bird and really thinking about that and kind of then going into other lighting situations, that's perfectly fine. It's really up to you. Like I said, I can't stress this enough. The most important thing is to make sure that you're paying attention to the light and it's not casting weird shadows onto your subject. For my first example of how the sun direction can help or hinder your shot, I have this shot of a indigo bunting right here. And when I saw the, this indigo bunting land on this branch, I really wanted this composition. I wanted to get in the whole perch, including the end. I thought it was a cool perch. I wanted the bird to be looking to the left so that it made sense that there was all this space here, give the bird a place to look into. The problem was though that Whenever the bird turned to the left, its whole face was in shadow here. And it's in shadow because of this leaf here. Because the sun is really to my left. It's not behind me at all, it's to my left. So whenever the bird looked in this direction, it would be in shadow. And I realized that this composition wasn't gonna work. And instead what I did was I looked through my shots and I found one where it was looking to the right, which didn't have any of the, those issues. And like this shot here, where it's completely to the right, it's its head is bright and there are no shadows or anything. I mean, I guess you could say there's shadows on, on this side of the bird, but that doesn't really bother me because the head and the eye are bright and sharp. So it wasn't the end of the world. I made it work, but I just couldn't use the original composition that I wanted. And the reason why I couldn't use the composition that I wanted with it looking this way was that the edge of frame would likely be somewhere, you know, in here. And so for it to be kind of looking to the edge of frame for me just doesn't usually work. So I decided on this composition instead. As my next example, I have this shot of a marbled godwit. And if you'll notice here, you can see that the sun is really on my right as opposed to the indigo bunting shot where it was on my left. Now it's on my right. And for the same reasons as the indigo bunting shot, because of where the sun is in relationship to me, there's this shadow on the head that I really don't like. There's also a shadow on the back, but that doesn't really bother me. It's really the shadow on the head that I have a problem with. And it's because of the sun angle, because I don't have the sun at my back, because the sun is you know way, way over here. But you can work with head angle in order to get a much more pleasing image like I did with the indigo bunting. So you go from this to this, which is closer. This is a profile shot and this head angle I have no problem with. It's, it's a profile shot, it works perfectly well. However, this one works a lot better. And the reason why is because of the sun angle, because it just works a little bit better. The head is a little bit better lit when it's when the bird's head is turned more towards me. And this one I wanted to show, uh, this is kind of more frontal lighting. 
Um, the sun is a little bit over my left shoulder, but it is much more frontal than the other shots that I've showed you guys. And as you can see, it's a very pleasing type of light and the whole bird is lit very evenly and there are no kind of odd shadows. So in this particular instance, it works really well. And this is another example of, uh, of frontal lighting. The lighting is very strong here, but again, I'm really pointing my shadow at the bird and the bird is nice and bright and evenly lit. Number three is perspective. The best perspective almost I would say like 98% of the time is going to be eye level with your subject or as close to eye level as you can get. Getting eye level with your subject is beneficial in a few different ways. One, it's the most flattering perspective of your subject. If you think about photographing a person, you would want to get eye level with that person and it's really the same for wildlife. So what does that mean? That means if you're photographing birds that are on the ground that you need to get on the ground. You need to get dirty. Don't be afraid to get muddy and mucky. It will really pay off in the photographs that you get. And the second thing that it does, it basically makes the surrounding environment the most flattering because getting eye level, it pushes the background further away from you so that you can kind of melt it away even without a super large aperture. Um, if it's far away enough, it can really melt the background away. It can mitigate any sort of ugly en environmental things. If you're shooting a bird, say like on pavement or in a gravel parking lot or something like that and create a much more pleasing environment and background. The last thing that it can do, and this is particularly for birds that are higher up than you, that you're shooting against sky. If you're more eye level, you're likely to not be shooting against sky and not only will the background be more interesting because you'll probably get some color in the background but it'll also be easier to expose when you're shooting up into sky in my opinion it's just not that interesting it's kind of boring and it's also really tough to get the bird or any subject properly exposed because the sky is so much brighter than your subject. You can mitigate that in post-processing. You can bring up the shadows of your subject. You can maybe overexpose the sky a little bit. And if you're shooting raw, you kind of bring the colors back, but it can just be really tough to get an interesting shot with just a plain blue background. I personally prefer a background with more color in it. I think that it not only looks better, I just think that it's more interesting and prettier. The first example I want to show you is of this dark eyed junco where my perspective is too high, right? I'm shooting this bird into the ground essentially. And the bird really disappears into this environment, not only because it's similar coloring, but also because there's not a lot of separation between the subject and the background in terms of sharpness, because there's not as much distance between the focal plane, which is this bird, and the rest of the image, right? So the, the background here is not far enough away for me to be able to blur it out. The foreground certainly is also not far away enough. It's just, it's all too close to the focal plane to really make the Junko stand out in any real way. As opposed to getting low, like say this dark eyed junko where I was lying in a gravel parking lot photographing this bird. And now there's a background that is further away from the bird. There's better background to subject separation and you can really see the, the bird much better and it really, really stands out. And here's an example of a subject that is really high up. I'm shooting, you know, into the, into the sky, which is fine. It's not my favorite. But that's not the only thing that bothers me about shooting birds that are higher up than me. It's also the perspective of the bird because here you can see the head pretty well, but really the most prominent part of this bird is the belly because that is what is closest to me. And depending on how kind of underneath the bird you're, you get, sometimes the head can be very obscured and you really can't see it well at all. So for me, photographing birds that are significantly higher than me can be really problematic. And the other thing that can be problematic is that it can be really hard for your camera to focus on the head because it's not the closest thing to you and it's often obscured by the rest of the body. 
So what happens a lot of the time is that your camera will grab focus on the shoulder or, you know, or the, or the, you know, the breast feathers or something like that. And the head of the bird will actually be a little bit soft. But that is a common problem. So that is just something to consider as opposed to this shot where this shot, this bird is actually a little bit lower than me. And I like the background here a lot better. And overall it's more evenly exposed and just more interesting to me. Not to mention I have a much better look at the head of the bird. It's easier for my camera to focus on it. And it's just a generally more flattering angle. Number four is backgrounds. Backgrounds is something that I never really paid attention to when I first started with bird photography. I was sort of like, well, whatever, it's the, the environment of the bird, it kind of is what it is. And while that is true, it's also important to think about, and especially if you can move to a point where you can get a more interesting background. And sometimes there really isn't anything you can do about it. It's just in the environment that it's in, and you can kind of work a little bit in post-processing to maybe do some branch removal if you're into that, or simply kind of burn down maybe some bright parts of the background, that kind of thing. It's really something to pay attention to and having a low perspective and being able to kind of to melt it away if it's not pleasing can really help you with that. I'm not saying that it always has to be a blurred sort of pristine background. I do like that look, but it's not something that you need all the time. It just has to be a background that works, that isn't too busy, and that works for your subject. We've touched on backgrounds in a few other examples, but I just wanted to give you guys another one where I specifically was talking about it. Here is a peacock, and it's a beautiful male. And this is an unprocessed shot. The background is not super pristine, but for me, this works okay. And if I was gonna process this, I would maybe burn this down, darken it a little bit to better emphasize the bird. But it's definitely workable. It definitely, to me, works and it's interesting. Now, I also, at the same location, I also photographed this female bird. And again, the background for me is just a lot less interesting. It's an overcast sky with some, you know, very kind of, I think, branchy, sticky trees in there. And not to mention the perspective again I'm kind of looking up at it and it's just not the most flattering perspective if you look at that one versus this one this one to me has a lot more going for it than this one and background is a part of that sometimes though you can get some interesting shapes and use that to your advantage even though it's really busy I thought that it worked. It's sitting in this less busy area, which I think works. It sort of has found this like hole in the vegetation. The rest of these kind of leaves are blurry, but to me, I still at least can tell what they are. And I just think that it's interesting. So you don't always need to have a really super pristine background. It just needs to work for your subject. So number five, the last thing I'm going to be talking about in this video is composition. What I see a lot on social media is people crop in their photos super, super tight. And you can tell it's a tight crop because the image quality is not great. And what I would encourage you to do is to think about what you can do with your subject in the environment and in the focal length, generally speaking, of course, everybody crops in a little bit, but generally speaking, what can you do with the sort of the focal length that you're working with in order to get an interesting image and maybe work with sort of more smaller in the frame shots and kind of think about what other parts of the environment that you like and what you can use in that compositionally to enhance your image, even if the bird isn't as large in the frame as you want it to be. Now, of course, this works sometimes better than it does others, and you can't save every photo, but it's just something to think about when you're out there in the field. If you find that you have to crop in really, really tightly to get the compositions that you want, um, to maybe think about changing up the way you approach birds, maybe try different types of birds that maybe, or maybe try a different location where the birds are a little bit more tolerant to people, maybe just practicing a little bit of patience and staying in one spot, maybe working with the blind. There are lots of ways to get closer to birds where you don't have to crop in so much. You can actually get the bird to fill your frame in a more natural way. Hummingbirds are a type of bird that I really, really like to 
shoot small in the frame because they're so tiny, right? I love to shoot them in circumstances where you really get to see how small they are. So this is a shot, I did crop this down, but this is a shot where I really left a lot of space around the bird. And the reason why I did that was because I really loved how small it was in the frame and how small they really are and how it, you know, it has these little teeny tiny feet on this leaf. And, and the bird compared to these leaves, it's just really small. And I just really love that. So those are five ways that you guys can immediately improve your wildlife photography. Please comment below if you try any of them. I would love to hear how it turns out. If you like this video, I would really appreciate you liking it and sharing and subscribing to my channel. It helps grow my channel and helps me bring you more content like this. So I would really appreciate it if you would do that. You can also find me on Patreon for as little as $2 a month. You can get early access to videos like this along with a bunch of other really cool stuff. This coming June, June 2019, I'm going to Olympic National Park and back. So I'm going to be posting patron only content every day for the month of June. So if you're interested in following my adventures, you can do so over there. You can also follow me on Instagram. I'm at emac underscore photo. You can see a lot of my photography on there. I post pretty much every day on there. So feel free to check that out as well. Until the next video, everybody take care. Happy adventuring. Happy shooting. See you later. Bye.